Hello. I'd like to thank the organisers for giving me this opportunity to tell you about some work we've been doing in Manchester using machine learning to look at unbalanced classes. My name is Alex Henderson, and this presentation outlines work recently published in The Analyst, which is available open access. Both the raw and processed data are available on Zenodo, and this video and slide deck will be made available from both my and the group's website following the conference. I think it's only fair to point out that Jenny did all the work, and I only hope I can do a good job in representing her today. So what is the class imbalance problem? Consider a piece of tissue stained with H&E to highlight the cell morphology. We can analyze this using infrared and build a model to identify various cell types. Note, however, that there is a wide range in the composition of the tissue. Some cell types only appear in very low abundance. And it's this difference in the number of spectra in each class that can present a problem when we come to build our chemometrics models. In this study, we've explored adaptive boosting, or Adaboost, and compared its performance against the random forest algorithm, now used by a number of groups, including ourselves. Both Adaboost and random forests fall into the category of ensemble methods. An ensemble is just in a way, another way of saying a collection, where the members of that collection are of the same type, but possibly different state. Ensemble methods use collections of what are called weak learners to attack the problem at hand. These methods use many weak learners, rather than a single strong learner. Strong learners can be difficult to build and may require a lot of data. They are tuned to the problem at hand, but can overfit if tuned too closely. Weak learners, on the other hand, are relatively easy to build. The term weak learner comes from the idea that they are really not very good at learning. A single weak learner has a success rate of barely over 50%, only just better than guessing or tossing a coin. However, when brought together en masse, they gel to form good models, better than the sum of the parts, you could say. So while a strong learner will be useful for specific challenges, weak learners benefit from the wisdom of the crowds. The most common weak learner in ensemble learning is the decision tree, and these are used in both random forests and Adaboost. Here, the variable that best separates the training set data becomes the root node. The data is then split into different branches. Each branch is considered separately, and the best variable for that branch becomes the decision point for the next split. The same variables can appear in different branches or in different orders, since the source data is changing after each split. Eventually, no further splits are required, and the outcome appears in leaf nodes. Remember that these trees are not meant to be very good at making decisions. That's the whole point. A random forest is a collection of decision trees with each tree being given a different set of variables. This prevents any single variable from dominating in the resulting model. For boosting approaches, Adaboost being the first and most common, we make the decision trees even more dumb by only allowing a single decision split. This produces what's called a decision tree stump. The root node is still defined around a variable that is the most important in separating the data in the training set, but other variables don't get a look in. Because there is only one split, the tree can't refine its decision, so it just has to go with what it's got. So Adaboost uses a collection of decision tree stumps rather than full trees. Each tree gets different variables in the same way as random forests, but the trees only get to make a single choice. The main difference between boosting techniques such as Adaboost and a bagging approach like random forests is that the boosting is iterative. So Adaboost is effectively a forest of stumps. Not to be confused with a forest of gumps. Sorry, I couldn't resist that one. The name Adaboost is short for adaptive boosting. In this case, the adaptive part is introduced by iteration and weighting. To start with, all samples are weighted equally. The decision tree stump then identifies a parameter that can split the data into class A or class B, in this case, triangles and squares. Any samples that were misclassified are then upweighted, and those correctly classified are downweighted. These modified data are then presented to a new decision tree. Since the weights on the previous misclassified samples are now higher, they are more likely to be correctly classified. Now it's important to point out here that we're not multiplying the spectral data points by this weighting. We're changing their relative importance to the algorithm. Next, the misclassified samples from the second iteration are upweighted, with the correctly classified samples being downweighted, and we go for a third iteration. 
After three iterations, we stop. We combine the iterations to produce the outcome of that tree set. So, by iterating and biasing each iteration in favor of samples that were wrongly classified in previous steps, we produce a stronger classifier. This might not be a very strong classifier, but it will be used in combination with others in the overall algorithm. As with the random forest approach, when we introduce test data, each tree or tree set gets a vote for whichever class it thinks that test sample should fall into. There are various metrics that can be used here, but the majority vote is the easiest to think about and easiest to apply. So now we have our problem and two potential algorithms to apply. How well do they work when presented with unbalanced data? To assess this, we used a tissue microarray containing breast cancer tissue from 208 patients. We selected 40 cores related to cancer and 10 relating to normal associated tissue. Normal associated tissue is tissue from regions adjacent to a tumour from non-malignant cores. You usually don't get access to healthy tissue. After all, most people don't want to have a biopsy unless there's some very good underlying medical reason. We manually annotated these tissues according to WHO guidelines and identified regions corresponding to cancerous epithelial and normal associated epithelium. We also annotated normal and cancerous stroma, but those spectra were not included in this study. So the first sampling method we will take a look at is undersampling. In this method, we identify the class with the fewest members and reduce all other classes to that number. This is simple to understand and to apply. The downside is that we tend to throw away lots of data. If the smallest class is much smaller than the others, we will end up discarding most of the data required. This has the knock-on effect of weakening the model because the data available for the training set will be a smaller sample of the acquired population. The good thing about undersampling is that all the spectra remain unique. There are no duplicates. The model will be unbiased and will have a higher variance. The opposite of undersampling is, of course, oversampling. In this scenario, we increase the numbers in each of the minority classes to match the class with the most members. This will increase the size of the training set, which could be problematic for a target algorithm or computational resources available. The biggest problem, however, comes when we have to decide on where these increased numbers will come from. There are lots of methods we can choose to oversample our data. Here I've listed four. The first simply takes a copy of the smaller class and appends it to itself. We can repeat this until we reach the size of the larger class. Of course, we'll never get an exact match. Well, pretty unlikely anyway. So we'll need a method of dealing with this over or underhang. We can simply ignore this and say our classes are now much more similar or we can use some form of randomization to get the exact number. This has the benefit of each spectrum in the minority class being equally represented in the newly generated group, well, without taking into account the randomness studies. And of course, there are other approaches we could take. The second approach uses something like a bootstrap sampling approach, which is sampling with replacement to randomly regenerate the minority class. Bootstrap has low bias and variance, but there could be samples that never actually get selected. That means we're throwing away some original data. Method 3 is similar to method 2, except that we ensure all of the minority class are included and only bootstrap the required difference. Then there is the option of changing the data. The first three methods simply selected or didn't select the spectra in the minority class. Another approach is to interpolate some of the spectra to generate data that was never actually acquired. One of these methods is called SMOT and is discussed in a paper by Plagas and Lusa. However, in this work we decided to go with method 3. This has the advantage of ensuring all the data required relating to the minority class are actually included in the training set, and any duplication being handled by the well-respected bootstrap algorithm. So how do we get on? First I should mention that the same independent test set was used in all cases. In addition, we tried to, as much as possible to create training sets that were built by either expanding or contracting existing training sets, rather than generating each one randomly. This has the advantage of showing the variation in having larger or smaller data sets, rather than new ones created randomly. If we were to create lots of random data sets, some trends might be hidden. In all cases, the exercise of generating training sets and testing them was repeated five times but with the same independent test set used in each case. So it's useful to get some ground truth 
So we know whether any changes we see as a function of sampling are actually due to the change in the size of the training sets themselves. We created balanced sets of different size from 2,500 per class down to 10. As you can see, both algorithms perform surprisingly well. It's not until we get down to 100 samples per class that Adiboost starts to fall over. At this point, all samples are being classified as normal associated. However, when we have large numbers per class, it performs a little better than random forests. Although we have to say that classification accuracies of 90% and over is really rather good, it's worth pointing out here that these data are generated from the same TMA, so accuracies of this level will probably not be maintained across different samples, instruments, etc. However, using the same sample has the benefit of removing these additional sources of error, so we can concentrate on the performance of the algorithms themselves and the sampling methods. On the right, we can see that the random forests method stays pretty strong, beyond 100 samples, and can even generate a reasonable result with only 10 samples per class. So, taking a closer view of the left-hand side of that plot, we generated some undersample training data. Each of these training sets has the same number of cancer and normal associated spectra, but at the size of the minority class gets smaller, you can see we end up throwing away lots of the majority class to match. Adaboost appears to outperform random forests, with the normal associated tissue being almost perfectly classified for all sample sizes. Although to be fair, they both do pretty well. The cancer samples do not perform quite as well, so more are being misclassified as the training sets get smaller. The variability in the random forest data is slightly larger too. Oversampling is a bit more complicated. The red box in the table on the right indicates the spectra that are unique. This that includes all of the cancer spectra and the normal associated spectra originally in the samples. In order to oversample, we randomly duplicate more and more of the normal associated to keep up with the growing cancer set size. The dark blue squares labeled D represent duplicates, while the light blue squares labeled U represent the original spectra. As you can see, by the time we have a ratio of 9 to 1, we have 4,500 cancer spectra, each of which being unique, but only 500 unique normal associated spectra. From these 500, we now need to randomly select another 4,000 spectra. So how does this duplication affect the outcome? Well, the added boost method still seems to perform strongly. Note that the two lines cross over when our ratio is very large. This is probably due to the duplication in the normal associated data leading to overfitting, and that being reflected in its inability to correctly classify the test data. The random forest's method performs less well, and appears to be more influenced by duplication than Adibus. It's worth taking a moment to compare the two sampling methods using the same algorithm. With Adiboost, it looks like oversampling works best, and the level of classification accuracy remains fairly constant as the sample sizes change. However, with random forests we get a different answer. Note how undersampling improves the normal associated accuracy, while the cancer samples become less well classified. However, with oversampling, we get the opposite effect. The cancer samples get better, but the normal associated fall away. This is worrying, because it means we could get a different answer depending on the choice of algorithm and the choice of sampling method. So, what did we learn from this work? Firstly, on this admittedly limited dataset, we can see that infrared does a good job of classifying cancer from non-cancer. We've been discussing values in the 85 to 95 accuracy range, and even allowing for the use of a single instrument and a single TMA, there is an indication that IR is useful here. However, we need to be careful in our choice of algorithm and sampling method because our results could be misleading. Adaboost seems to be slightly better at classification, and both Adaboost and Random Forests will give good accuracy down to about 100 spectra per class using undersampling. And random forests remains relatively stable until we reach very small class sizes in the tens. Other boost seems to be stable to oversampling, while random forests is only stable for ranges that are relatively close, down to about 70-30. Coming back to our original question, for unbalanced classes, will other boost come to the rescue? Well, I think the jury is still out. However, I think other boost is a contender, and we should do more work in this area to see how useful it can be. Thanks for listening.